Welcome back. And as we discussed in our last lecture, qualitative research is a tool we can use to reset our understanding of the world around us and to obtain real, deep, nuanced, contextual information that's vastly superior to whatever we can invent from our own experiences. It allows us to hold a light up in the darkness, to see what isn't immediately obvious, and to have clarity about the shadows and shapes that we see in the distance. So one of the things we're going to talk about in this lecture is four distinct uses of qualitative research and which methods are best suited to these applications. But the great thing about qual is that it's wonderfully creative and a flexible approach to data gathering. And I don't want you to think that this list that I'm going to show you is exclusive. Rather, these four approaches that you can try with are, are, are approaches that you can try with confidence because they have a background of practical and scientific application. And I have this grid here that you can see, and it's a, it has different levels of familiarity that a researcher might have with a topic as well as that a participant might have with a topic. And this two by two is really useful because it can help us to look at four different approaches. One of them is what we're going to call exploration. One of them is what we're going to call a deep dive. One of them is what we're going to call idea generation. And the other is what we're going to call testing. Now let's look at each of these individually. The first of these applications is exploration. And I don't want you to confuse this with the broader term of exploratory research, but those two uh, terms definitely do have some overlap. Exploration is simply about going into an area where you don't have very much information and learning as much as possible. And in qualitative research, this often begins by talking to experts and identifying what information you'd like to know before you go out and start using primary methods to collect it. And it's, uh, what's nice about using research as a means of exploration is that you tend to go in with an open mind and very little bias about what you'll learn. If you're rigorous with exploration you, and you clearly define all your informational deficiencies, you can develop a firm foundation of information that can guide you when it comes to further research down the road. And since exploration is so open-ended, all of the major qualitative methods that we're going to learn in this class, observation, in-depth interviews, ethnographies, and focus groups, are appropriate for it. The downside of exploration, though, is that organizations that need to engage in it often don't want to spend the time or money required to do it properly because they often feel like they already have all the answers. Many times, the best time to conduct exploration research is when an organization is investigating a new market or service line or when a new manager or agency takes over an established role and it's ready to look and they're ready to look for new opportunities exploration requires ambition it's very hard to convince people who think that they have the answers to already uh, already to engage in it so just keep in mind that ambition is a primary driver of the willingness to do that style of research the second application is often called a deep dive or a drill down. And what sets it apart from exploration is that it's often guided by previous research and focused more specifically on a certain area of informational need. For example, in our Cable Town scenario from the previous lecture, the customer service manager might decide to drill down on those gimme jimmies and develop a better understanding of who they really are by focusing some qualitative research on them. Deep dive research often involves going in with some preconceived ideas and focusing on understanding the how and why of collected data. But there are times where deep dive research has to be used right off the bat, such as in business to business studies or B2B studies, and where populations are small, highly qualified, and hard to access. Deep dives tend to be achieved through in-depth interviewing and perhaps ethnographic research. Focus groups aren't very good at deep dives because they tend to stay in the shallow end of the pool, and observational research usually doesn't provide enough understanding. The best time to conduct a deep dive is when new questions arise from previous research or when quantitative research is simply not giving a clean enough read on a subgroup or a cohort. But the biggest danger of deep dives is that too much time and effort can be spent focusing on the wrong group if a manager gets too focused on trying to, un un uh, to know the unknowable. Often, deep dives are used inappropriately to try to figure out how to get a certain group of people like prospects or former customers or uh, people who are uh, splitting their time between a competitor and your own business to behave differently when they should instead be used to understand how a certain group of people behave naturally. So just remember, qualitative research is about learning how people already think and behave, not about cracking some secret code that's somehow going to change their thoughts or behavior. Getting involved in marketing research that seeks ways to find ways to change people is folly. No matter how good your information or models may be, you can never accurately predict what an individual is going to do all the time, nor can you use past behavior to predict future behavior and expect your model to hold forever. 
even our hardwired psychological systems that we think we understand in our in our minds tend to be much more complicated than anyone realizes and the literature in the social sciences is filled with theories about human behavior that have been undone by skeptical research when the ideas run its course. Reproducibility is a huge problem in the social sciences. You just have to keep that in mind. So be careful about the intended application of any deep dives that you perform. The third application is idea generation, and that involves using qualitative research to arrive at new insights driven by customers or end users. And this application can be extremely useful but it's also an area where you have to be really careful about whom you include in your sample. Idea generation works best with end users or expert consumers who know a lot about a product or service and who can make smart suggestions. It works very poorly with your average consumer or end user who's put little thought into providing a critique and who tends to struggle with coming up with new ideas. For example, let's say that Samsung, who makes smartphones, wants to conduct some research with consumers to figure out how to improve its next Galaxy smartphone. Conducting that research with the general public is out of the question. And even selecting just Android users or just Samsung smartphone owners can be iffy. A lot of people have Android devices and don't know that much about them. And there's a lot of people that have Samsung Galaxy phones that don't know that much about them. But most consumers have a very basic understanding of how they work and what features they might desire. And so if your research is focused just on that, you're going to be okay but if you want anything more you're going to have to talk to the right group and that group is expert users who are going to tend to know the ins and outs of the galaxy phone as well as those of competitors whether in the android phone space or maybe even over in the iphone space which is really different they're going to have a good idea of what features will create parity with competitors and what features um are new and different and they'll also have a more pointed critique about issues like overall design expandability hardware compatibility, and so forth. They're going to provide far better ideas than most consumers will because they know a lot more and they've thought a lot more about it. The downside to talking to these experts, however, is they can be a little too expert and they may have ideas that are of interest to them, but which aren't appealing to consumers more broadly. For example, many expert smartphone users like extra features like being able to have sophisticated options for things like enhanced photography or wireless charging. General consumers tend to be much more concerned about having phones that don't break and which are easy to use. Creating a phone to appeal to expert users is gonna add cost and features that aren't needed for the broader market, but which will avoid the real issues that concern the everyday users, like ease of use and durability. This distinction between experts and consumers is important, and it's one reason that idea generation needs to be combined with our next application, which is testing, to be of much use. Idea generation is well suited, by the way, to in-depth interviews or to focus groups, but don't discount observational research and ethnographies in this uh, approach. They can be quite useful for spotting how end users are using products or services in non-traditional ways and either overcoming weaknesses of a poor design or creating new problems that designers never intended by failing to follow directions or usage guidelines. And, um, there is a, a real uh, opportunity when you're doing idea generation to hear things that you never would have even thought of coming from the people in the audience. Many smartphone users, for example, cover their smartphones with protective cases, which makes sense from their point of view. They want to protect these expensive phones from damage. But those have problems. They can make the phone heat up more rapidly or behave oddly if the case provides too much insulation or if it blocks the antenna. Heat can be bad for electronics, and it can make phones designed to look beautiful, but which don't have great heat dispersion, run terribly. Cases can also interfere with those antennas, like I mentioned, making them work less reliably. Observational research and ethnographies would catch these sorts of problems far better than verbal qualitative methods where you're asking people to articulate them. The danger of idea generation, however, is that research can be used as a proxy for decision making. Consumers told us they wanted this new feature is a really dangerous statement to make if it's not backed up with solid testing and further validation. Managers also have a tendency to blame research for their own bad impulses when it comes to jumping on half-baked ideas. They'll hear something in a study, push it forward as being conclusive, and then claim the research was flawed when that idea doesn't work out. And that's why our fourth application, testing, is so important. Qualitative research is very good at testing ideas or concepts with small groups of individuals, and it can provide a tremendous amount of depth and insight, even with just a few interviews or a couple of focus groups. One of the reasons for this is that ideas are often better in our heads 
than they are in execution. And even a well-designed concept or prototype can be bewildering to those who haven't uh, been involved in its development and who aren't able to make the logical connections to understand how it works. The reality is that nothing that we encounter springs from a vacuum. Every idea we come across is built on some other idea. And if we've missed out on the evolution of a concept, we can find that new idea bewildering. You see this in consumer electronics all the time where interface design or feature design doesn't make any intuitive sense to the end user, but there was a progression internally that led to it being designed that way. And this is one reason that advertising so often falls flat with consumers. It's easy for us as consumers to look at advertising and be blind um, to all of the time and thought that went into crafting a message. What we don't recognize is that the people who put the message together often spent months thinking about how to communicate a brand, product, or service and went through many revisions to get things to a point of view where they felt good about the execution. They connected dots that we did not. They went through a progression of ideas we didn't experience. They thought about the brand more deeply than most of us ever will. And yet, they crafted a message that nobody understands. And so much advertising fails to make an impression because of that. Not because it's badly made, but because it's received by an audience that can't connect to it. We haven't been part of that evolution, and so we don't get it. And unless the advertising is really effectively designed and tested well, many of us will not make those connections ever. Even testing advertising, though, can prove difficult because one of the unfortunate side effects of qualitative research is the false sense of confidence it can generate. When consumers are being confronted with items to test in a qualitative study, they're being asked to give their opinions on something and immediately it makes it more important to them than it would be in a natural setting. Often they're being paid for these opinions and they want to say something that justifies their participation in the research. And since they're being shown two or three or four ideas and being asked to rate, rank, or comment on them, consumers often feel a need to provide much more depth and detail of analysis than they ever would in real life. The correct way to test advertising messaging is to ask, does it communicate what it's try trying to communicate? But the people who create advertising are creative individuals who often don't like to hear their work dissected into such a cold, lifeless analysis. They want to hear consumers communicate vibrancy and warmth and emotion that justifies all the time and effort they put into their work. They want to hear consumers were moved, that they were entertained, that they're willing to change the way they see the world because of a well-made message. But you can't test for that. And you can't use qualitative research to see that result. Because qualitative research isn't about cause and effect, nor does it typically anchor itself to long-term behavior. Testing must be disciplined. It has to focus on specific areas of measurement with direct applicability to the elements of the brand, product, service, or message that's being evaluated. If you're testing an idea, you need to test the elements of that idea and ensure you know what's working and what's falling flat. If you're testing a product or service, you need to determine whether that test is guided or unguided and how you want to evaluate a participant's ability or inability to use it properly. If you're testing advertising, you want to make sure you're measuring much more than a simple, did you like concept A or concept B better sort of statement. Used correctly, testing can provide a wealth of insights. And again, it often doesn't require a large or even representative sample size to provide much insight. If your idea is so complicated that the first three Consumers that you present it to can't make heads or tails of it. Chances are good the next 20 to 30 are going to feel the same way. <coughs> if a design trips up two or three people early on in your testing, you'll probably see it continue to crop up in further research until you fix it. The only state which does require thorough testing is success. It's worth testing a refined idea over and over until you're certain that success is not a fluke. So understanding these four different applications is tremendously helpful in designing qualitative research and it will ensure you make the most of what this style of research has to offer. But before you think of a method, before you plan out a sample size, before you even offer a whiff of a phrase like focus group or in-depth interview, be sure to think about the application of the data you want to collect. Be sure to think about how familiar you are and how familiar a participant is with a topic. Be sure to think about the aims of what you want to do. And in order to do that, you're going to need to follow a process that prioritizes defining your research problem and your informational needs above all else. That, as it happens, is the topic of our next lecture.